So do you ever find yourself wondering why somebody else is questioning your motives? Am I the only person this happens to? That's good. Man, that's a great response. That was like five people know right away. So last week, I had somebody point out that I had stains all over my shirt when I spoke. Let me explain why I had stains all over my shirt because my motives are really important in this moment. So last week, as we were getting ready, I was, I was kind of wandering around outside and was about to come inside the room, and I noticed the youth were playing this game where they were eating baby food out of diapers. It looked like fun. <laughs> and there was one particular young man who did not have a partner to feed. And so I mistakenly assumed it would be something beautiful like peaches or applesauce or pick a baby food that's okay to eat. It was green beans. <laughs> so I did what all babies do. I went and I started spitting it up and it went down my beard and down my shirt and into the diaper and the whole deal. And I cleaned it off and I thought, well, it's a black shirt. It won't show. It showed. We are doing a series called The Upside Down Kingdom. And this week, we're going to talk about motives. What motivates you? What do you, what do you find in your own soul? And if you're honest with yourself, like me, you think your motives are 100 all the time. And if people just understood where you were coming from, your perspective and your motives, everything would be okay. But they don't, and they're not willing to ask. And you're not willing to share, actually. You just assume everybody would know your motives are good. That's what we're talking about today when we talk about pure at heart. Blessed are the pure at heart. Because pure at heart, everything about that gets at motives. In this upside-down kingdom, Jesus looked at a group of people who were the outcast of society. They were the outsiders. And he looked at them as he called them out and named the different people in the space. And some of those were pure at heart. I can't imagine what that must have felt like in that moment. To be in that place of going, I knew I was on the right path, and now Jesus is standing in front of me affirming me. How beautiful that must be. If I can, I want to share a little story about some of my own personal motives. Years ago, when I, uh, when I was on staff at Smoky Hill Vineyard back in the old days, a long, long time ago, there are a few people in this room who actually remember those days, uh, but they were back in, I joined staff right at the beginning of, right at the end of 1999. My first job was to make sure we could have church in case Y2K took the building and the power out. Yep, I had generators, I had space, I had those big construction kind of heaters. I was smart. I saved the boxes and the receipts, took them right back in January, okay? All right. But we follow the Lord. I followed the Lord in the ministry in this season as I started hitting 2001. There was a major cost for me. Most of you know this part of my story. Uh, unfortunately, I lost a marriage in the midst of this. Had a, had a, my ex-wife walked away from the Lord, walked away from me, walked away from the kids, walked away from the whole deal. So all of a sudden I found myself as a single dad. I almost lost my kids in that, in that time, in that season. I had a thankful that Greg, uh, the senior pastor, founding pastor of Smoky Hill Vineyard, walked through that season with me, actually let me continue to do my job at a part-time basis and paid for counseling for me to kind of get whole and healed and take care of the kids. Fast forward about two years later, and I am now marrying my intern, Christy. Super scandalous story. Yes, yes, God was good. We all know it. We knew it then. I don't think we all fully understood what an imbalance it was. Like, I got, I got like 95% of the good part of that deal, right? <laughs> Thank you for not arguing with me. And it seems that things are getting better. But literally, three days before we close on our first house together, Christy's company goes bankrupt. Like she shows up for work and there are chains on the doors. And all of a sudden, our 
take-home income went to about half. Actually, a little bit less than half because ministry jobs don't pay very well. I don't know if you've heard this. And she was working in the corporate world. And, and I, you know, as we're now about to get, go to a closing, we're like, wow, do we tell them if they ask us? We're like, we're gonna, we told our mortgage broker, we told our realtor, if they ask if we still have, she still has this job, we have to say no. And it would have meant that we wouldn't have gotten the house. Somehow they never asked. They always ask. Has anything changed in your employment status? But they didn't ask. So we got a house. Beautiful. House was not more than about a mile from here. It's beautiful, beautiful. So now I had somebody with me to help me raise my kids, but now we also had a mortgage on about 40% of our income. Then uh, one year later, I take an additional 50% pay cut to leave Smoky Hill Vineyard and go help Mile High Vineyard, go help Jay Pathak for a year. And I start seminary. So not only do I take another pay cut, so if you can do the math with me, from 40% to half of that is 20%. So we're now about 20% of our income. Thankfully, she did take a part-time job doing, or a job with doing a little bit of uh, uh, processing for a mortgage company. So she got a little bit more in income. So let's call us at about 45% of what we were at originally. All right? How are we doing? We doing okay so far? I got too many numbers in here for you? Okay. So I go, we go help Jay, and I start seminary. So not only are we doing this with a reduced pay cut, but now we're taking on debt as I start seminary. And there were moments, um, moments where we, we found ourselves going, God, you really are in this, right? You know what you're doing. We trust you. We believe in you. So let's fast forward another year later. Uh, my time with Jay is up. The amount of money that was set aside to help pay for us is gone. So now we're at about 25%. And we had these moments where if I could be really honest with you, they were really angry conversations with God. What have you asked us to do? Why in the world would we still want to follow you into this? And then you want us to go plant a church? You must be outside your mind. Anybody seen Remember the Titans? Blue, you must be outside your mind. Okay. So we had these conversations with God, and we found, I found myself, I won't speak for Christy, she's way more godly than I am. I found myself having to have conversations with God, and the question he kept asking me over and over again is, are you motivated by me taking care of your needs, or are you motivated by what I called you to? Oh, right? That's what it was, I was getting all the time. This challenge, challenge. He's asking questions like, am I pursuing God's calling so that you will bless me, Lord? Why was I expecting everything to be easy? And then he asked me, goes, us to go to plant a church, which, by the way, is not easy. And then the question that really stuck was, would I follow God even in the difficult where it doesn't make sense? Was I willing to lose the house? Was I willing to lose... The car. I think we had the car at that time. What was I willing to give up? How about you? Do you find yourself at places wondering, am I doing this so that God will bless me? Am I doing this so that others will notice me? Am I doing this so that others will think good of me? Am I doing this so that I will think good of myself? Are we even aware of these places of maybe selfishness in our own soul? Or do we, do we rationalize it and make our motives okay? Now, before you beat yourself up, let me, let me pause real quick. Before you beat yourself up, just know that God has more grace for you than you can have for yourself. God is not a God who is, wants to beat people up. He is a God who has tremendous grace and kindness for you. So as we head into this text about pure at heart, I want you to be carrying in what are my motives with you as we talk through this, okay? So I'm going to pray. We're going to dive in. Uh, I'm also going to pray for our veterans. Uh, this, of course, is Memorial Day weekend. We're so thankful for those that have served and especially those that have have family members who have lost their lives serving to defend our country. We're thankful for this country where we get to worship Jesus openly. So I'm going to pray for that as well, okay? 
So, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to be together. I thank you for your life. I thank you for the things that you spoke to us. I thank you for the things that you taught us, Lord. And I ask, God, that you would speak uh, through me today, that you would, you would speak clearly to our hearts and to our, our minds, and, Lord, to our actions, that this would bring, bring something out of it for us. And, Lord, we are so grateful for those that have laid down their lives to defend this country, that we get to live in a place where we get to worship you, Jesus, openly. And, Lord, I just pray for those, those around the country, those around our community, those maybe uh, in this room and a part of our community here, our family, that, God, that those that have lost loved ones, uh, in the line of duty, Lord, that you would, you would come alongside, you would speak grace and, and kindness and mercy in the midst of gro- loss and grieving. Jesus, you said yourself, there is no greater love than one who would lay down their life for another. Thank you for those who have laid down their lives for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. All right, so Matthew 5, 8. Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So Jesus is actually quoting scripture here. When Jesus hangs on the cross and says, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's actually quoting a song. And what would happen in this culture is that when teachers would quote a part of a psalm or a few words from a psalm, everybody would then know the rest of the psalm. Now, it's interesting is that would they have known the rest of all the Old Testament prophecies? Probably. But even those who weren't necessarily like like really good Jews, like the ones that were like studying all the time, they still would have understood psalms because psalms were sung. They were songs that people would sing. So let let me say this. When you have a hard time remembering something, remember how hard it is to memorize Scripture, Right? Like, it's hard to memorize scripture. It's a lot of work. But if you can figure out how to put it into a song, to a, like a Taylor Swift song, a tune, like it, it gets really easy. I don't have one that would work right now. I can't think of one. But I'm sure there's somebody out there who's done this. But when you think about, like, I hear songs that I haven't heard in 20 years, and they come on the radio, and I, I know, still know most of the words, right? This is what it was like when Jesus quotes a song that people remember, they know the whole thing. They don't know just the few words. They understand the whole psalm. So Jesus is quoting uh, Psalm 24. It would be like me saying to you, for God so loved the world. And everyone would say, well, that he gave his only son, right? Or saying, our Father in heaven. And everybody would say, well, hallowed be your name, right? This is the same kind of moment that's happening. So Jesus is quoting Psalm 24. Psalm 24, 3 and 4. David writes, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. So who has clean hands and a pure heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. See, this pure in heart thing really does speak to something else that's going on. Jesus is raising the bar. He's now saying it's not just your actions that determine your life with God. It is now what's going on inside of here. What's going on in your heart? In other words, it's not just doing the right things. It's doing the right things with right motives, with right heart. This way of even saying the heart, is really this idea of, of it's so much more, it's, it's all of it. It's not just, it's not just the, 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 the way we feel. It's not just the ways we think. It's not just the, the soul and the stuff. It's all of those things together. They all come together. It really does go back to the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and some version strength. It's all of who you are. And so when Jesus says, blessed are those, blessed are the pure heart, he's making a point that there's something internal that needs to change. Now, this is so different from the way the Pharisees, the teachers of the day, were operating. They were operating this idea about they were making these really clear uh, delineations between all the different rules, and they were taking all the Old Testament 
uh, rules and law and then breaking them down and even giving you interpretation on what was the law meant and what was okay and not okay. They were getting so detailed that they were losing the forest for the trees. They were focusing on all the little minutia rather than focusing on the, the heart of the matter. So when Jesus says, man was made for the Sabbath, not Sabbath for man. I'm sorry, Sabbath was made for man, not man for Sabbath. I almost messed that up. I sound like a Pharisee right there. You were going to let me too. Half of you were going to let me. Okay. This idea that the Sabbath was intended for us as humans to have an opportunity to rest and recuperate and be with God. It wasn't so that we could serve in some sort of way or follow a religious law or a rule. So Kenneth Bailey in his book, Jesus to Middle Eastern Eyes, he says, with the pure in heart, what you see is what you get, as the colloquial phrase has it. They have one motive for what they do, and they harbor no hidden agendas. Most Western culture limits the word heart to the feelings, but the heart and the Hebrew mind included the entire interior life of the person. I'm going to say that again. But the heart and the Hebrew mind included the entire interior life of the person. The feelings, the mind, and the will were all part of the heart. This idea that we are congruent in the way we live, that we, we live in such a way that then our actions then flow out of our heart. Jesus talks a lot about that, about this idea that overflow, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. See, when Jesus comes into your life, when you say yes to following Jesus, it's not like all of a sudden everything gets great. You don't all of a sudden look better. You don't all of a sudden have better clothes, drive a better car, live in a better house. It's not this idea that everything around you all of a sudden changes from the outside. You still may not cut your hair. You still may have really bad beard shape. I don't know. Or not. You may have no hair. I don't know. The point is, is that it, it doesn't, it's not like your exterior all of a sudden changes. And what we do sometimes is we think, once I say yes to Jesus, it solves all my problems. No, it doesn't. It does not. Matter of fact, I am here to tell you that sometimes saying yes to Jesus makes your problems seem worse for a while. What it does change is here. It changes the way you respond to him. And as you follow God over and over again, the inside of who you are, it changes the exterior approach. The only people in all of the Gospels that Jesus takes on over and over and over again are the Pharisees, the religious leaders. And he takes them on because they are so worried about their outward expression of their faith and their hearts are full of garbage. And the whole of the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus raising the bar saying, it's not just about murder, it's about committing murder in your heart. It's your motives. It's not just about adultery, it's committing adultery in your heart. It's your motives. Stop playing games with oaths. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Stop playing games with this stuff. Jesus is after the heart. Sadly, if we're honest with ourselves, we can fake it really well. And I think this is what Jesus is pointing out. Now, before I go any further, let me just say this really quickly. No one else can define somebody else's motives. This is one of these moments where when we start talking about motives, if you're right now elbowing your spouse, stop it. You can't define their motives for them. This is one of those places where this really is a you and God conversation only. I can't tell you what's really going on inside of all of who you are. I can't. Only the Lord knows that. And we're really good at kind of faking it a little bit when we need to, right? It's okay. You can say yes. We all know that the answer is yes. So I just want to be really clear. We have to be also really clear that we don't judge others' motives. Now, we can call out bad action, bad behavior, but we have to be really careful not to call out motives. This is something Christy and I, it's a freebie, by the way. When Christy and I do premarital counseling, when we help couples walk through conflict resolution, we make it really clear you cannot challenge the other person's motives. You can say this behavior did this to me. You can't go after 
And I know you did that on purpose because of this and because of that and because you were feeling this way. Bad. Don't do that. All right. So let's read the rest of the psalm. Let's go back and read Psalm 24, 3, not all the way through 6. Because I want you to see the other part of this. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands. By clean hands, David means clean action, right action, and a pure heart. Who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Do you hear that? When you have clean hands and a pure heart, you will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God your Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. What a beautiful, beautiful text. There's a promise here, and it goes back to the promise of the beatitude. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. They will see God. Now, you may say, yeah, well, I experience God every day. But you have to realize that until Jesus came, that was impossible. Like even Moses... The one who God shows up to and has conversations with over and over and over again has a moment where Moses asks to see him, and he says, you cannot see me, but I will pass by you. It will kill you to be in that presence. Do you know who gets to see God in all the scriptures? Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Before sin, They were with and saw and spoke and lived life with God. This is the beauty of what Jesus does. What Jesus did on the cross was he paid for all the sins of all humans. But let me break it down even clearer for you. He paid for all the sins you have ever committed or committing now (laughs) and will commit next week, next month, next year, and however many years you're still alive. He's paid for them all. And he now has created this this opportunity for you to live with God in such a way that you actually get to see God. When we're in heaven, it tells us in Revelation 22 that we're going to get to see God. It just describes this idea of the heaven and earth reunited that's going to be like Eden. But we get to live in this in-between, the upside-down kingdom where where the leader the Savior comes and gives us life away so that you and I can have life. Now, if you feel like this is too overwhelming, let me just, let me just go talk about David for a minute. So David writes Psalm 24, but he also writes Psalm 51. And Psalm 51 is David's psalm when he writes after he has murdered his friend Uriah and stolen his wife Bathsheba. And we find ourselves in some of these moments as we look at Old Testament Scripture and we think, okay, at least I'm not that guy, right? Do you ever feel that way? Sometimes you read some stories in Old Testament and you go, could be worse, could have been that guy, right? Here's the deal. God says that David was a man after God's own heart. So there was something in David that I think is really instructive. Matter of fact, I think you can go compare David's response when Nathan comes and calls him out on a sin with Saul's response when Solomon calls him, or when the Solomon, <laughs> when Samuel calls him out in his sin. Saul makes excuse after excuse after excuse. David repents right away. So Psalm 51 is David's repentance prayer to God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. He's not hiding. He's not running. He's not pretending he didn't do it. He's owning it, owning it, owning it. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Let me pause for a minute. There are real consequences to David's sin. There are things that happen that he ends up losing. They lose a child. He ends up, his kingdom ends up kind of falling apart. His family is an absolute disaster from this point forward. But David, before the Lord, is made right because he goes and owns everything. But now I want you to skip down. Let's go down to verse 10. I want you to see how he responds to this. 
It's an OG worship song, by the way, for those who are a little bit older. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Can we leave these words up for just a minute? I want you to see this. This idea of creating me a new heart, a pure heart rather, this is the same word for that was used in Genesis 1 when it says, and on the first day God created, and on the second day God created, and on the third day God created. Our creator God has the ability to create within us something new. It's beautiful language. It's language hearkening back to God the creator and what God's inviting us into. By your mercy, God, would you create in me something pure? I can't do it on my own. I got news for you. This is still true for us today. Even with Jesus, with Jesus having paid all these other debts for us, we still cannot create a pure heart on our own. Only through our creator God's power can we even be remotely pure. And then restore to me the joy of your salvation. It's this beautiful, beautiful response of of God responding to David's repentance. Hey, if you find yourself right now going, Mike, if you only knew, if you only knew what I've done, if you've only known, knew the stuff that's happening right now, if you only knew the, the thing that I'm feeling so guilt over, so much guilt over right now, I don't know. Here's what I do know. It's God knows. And your God has so much grace for you, and I promise you that if you will own it to him, he responds right away. We serve a God who has so much mercy that even pre-Jesus, David could come in this level of repentance, and he responds. It's so much simpler for us today. We just get to say, Jesus, help. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Create something new inside of me. God responds to this repentance. We have said before that Smoky Hill Vineyard, Larkspur Church, that we believe changed lives transform communities. Changed lives. Changed lives don't get changed because everything was perfect before and then we said yes to Jesus and now it's even more perfect. Changed lives get changed because we recognize and face the failures and the mistakes and the places where we have missed the mark. And we say, but God have mercy on me. The one thing that holds all humanity together is our brokenness. Without Jesus, we are completely broken. We've all sinned. We've all broken it. Romans is very clear. We've all fallen short of God's glory. But Jesus comes in and responds to us. So what do we do with this? How do we respond? Well, I have three kind of things I want to do, and one of them is the the big one, and I want you to hear this one. God is in the redemption business. God is in the redemption business. I want you to hear this one more time. God is in the redemption business. This idea of being pure at heart is not possible without God redeeming us. None of us have a pure heart without God redeeming us, our story, our mistakes, our brokenness. Purity is a byproduct of redemption. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. There's your upside down kingdom. For he, God, has rescued us. Our creator God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We don't earn it. We can't make it happen. We just get to say yes to the gift. And God is in the redemption business. He sees our hearts through the filter of Jesus and what Jesus did on the cross. And so when he sees us, he, when you say yes to Jesus, he sees you through the filter of Jesus mapped over your life. 
Oh, man. It's so good. It's so good. All those places where the, the enemy wants to lie to you and say, you haven't paid enough for that sin yet. God says, no, 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 no. I see you through Jesus. Therefore, we don't, speak, we don't seek purity as the end goal. We seek a person, Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, Everything that we have, right thinking and right living, a clean slate and a fresh start, comes from God by way of Jesus Christ. Everything. Does that mean like our home? Yes, it says everything. What about my marriage? Yes, everything. So I have to thank God for my marriage? Yes, you do. What about my job? Yes, everything. What about what, what, these kids sometimes? Yes, sometimes, right? Right now we have two dogs. One, I would just assume not be a part of everything. One is totally a part of everything, right? So yes, everything. Everything. What about all this, like, God made me pretty smart, Mike. You just don't know. Oh, I think I do know. And trust me, God knows. And it's everything. About now, if you've been paying attention, you're asking the question, what about clean hands? We've talked about pure heart. What about clean hands? Will your actions or will my actions ever start to improve? Yes. Yes. The more we say yes to Jesus in here, the more things start to change out here. So let me give you an example. Years ago, I discovered I have something that's called the heart attack gene. Has anybody heard about this? They do genetic testing. They figure out what's going on with your body and your system. I had these doctors that did this genetic testing. They said, hey, Mike, we got news for you. We understand now why you can't lose weight. You have the heart attack gene. I'm like, why does that mean I can't lose weight? And they're like, well, actually, the news is even better than that. You have both heart attack genes. I said, great. They said, so if you don't change the way you eat, you're going to die sooner than later. I'm like, awesome. Thanks for sharing. I feel so much uplifted and better about this. What happened is, is they started talking to me about the way my body was wired, that certain kinds of foods actually make things worse. So if I eat lower carbs, by the way, they really help. I can actually keep weight off in a way that I could not do before inside out. What I changed by putting into my system actually changed my outward appearance. Some might say, not so much for the better, Mike. Maybe or maybe not. That's debatable. The difference, what a point I'm trying to make, though, is that the inside changes the outside. It's the same in our life with Jesus. The more we say yes to Jesus, the more we walk with him, the more we live life with others, the more we do the things that are talked about in Acts 2.42, hanging out with other believers, having meals together, praying and studying scripture, the more things start to change in here, the more our actions start to change out there. You could still do really good actions, but I tell you, when you do really good actions and the heart's in the right place, it's so much better. It changes. It's a life changer. It's world changing. The result is we get to see God's face. Matthew 5, 8 out of the message, this beatitude, you're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. Then you can see what God's up to. See, God is on the move all around us. Sometimes we're not really paying attention. Have you noticed? You're like, Mike, have you seen the outside world? Yeah, it's nuts. People are cray-cray. They have lost their minds. But God's still in the move. God hasn't given up yet. We have to be careful that we don't judge what we see out there. We let, jo we let God judge the motives. We let God judge the heart. So let me finish my story if I can about Christy and I, you know, sacrificing for God. Me being all bitter, going, God, I've, been, I've given up everything for you. Right? We, uh, not long after this moment where we are living on almost nothing, and we're literally paying our mortgage and utilities, and that's about it, putting gas in the car. We had friends invite us over for dinner, 
and we just were sharing with them. They were people that used to go to Smoky Hill. They were, they were longtime leaders there, and she was an incredible prayer warrior and uh, prayed for us for years and years and years. And we were sitting at their house kind of saying, we just, we need you to pray for us. We don't know what we're going to do. She walks in the kitchen, comes back out with a whole bunch of plastic King Supers and Safeway bags and says, would you go shopping in my pantry? Christy and I look at each other and we're like, I, I, we're, not, we're not going to take any of your food. She said, either you can grab food out of my pantry, what you want, or I will just give it all to you. So we went and got food out of her pantry. Cried all the way home. Then she reminded us that Smoky Hill was, had just started a food bank. The beginnings of Hope Starts Here. It wasn't even called Hope Starts Here then. It was just Smoky Hill Food Bank. And our friend Ryan, who I was on staff with, was running it at the time. And they were like, why don't you just call Ryan and, and have, him help, have him let you in and go get some stuff. So I reached out to Ryan, and he goes, yeah. He says, come up on Friday evening or Friday afternoon. He goes, it's when we're unloading everything and getting everything ready for Saturday morning. Just come shop then. So for about at least six months, I think it was more like nine months, I went every Friday night shopping at the Smoky Hill Food Bank. And I would come home with different kinds of foods and cereals. The kids would go, ooh, we're getting Frankenberries. And I'm like, yep, that's what was at the store this week. No blueberries? Nope, just Frankenberries. That's what was there, right? And they never knew. They just thought it was so cool that whatever we showed up with was good enough. Like literally all we had to do was buy milk. And then, and then if I can share this one, somebody left us right around Christmas time, right before Christmas time, somebody left us $500 of cash in our mailbox anonymously so we could do Christmas for the kids. Christy and I are like 99% sure who it was. It was a sweet grandmother lived across the street from us. Loved Jesus. We're really, really sure it was her. But we never called her out on it. But it didn't matter. It's almost like God was laughing at us. So I, Christy's already there, but I started to get really grateful. I started looking around and going, God, I see you moving. I see what you're doing. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for the ways that you're moving. I'm so thankful for the ways that you're taking care of us. I'm so thankful we're not in more debt. I'm so thankful the car is not breaking down. I'm so thankful, whatever. It flipped everything. Now, I would love to say that immediately somebody dropped 20 grand on us and somebody else gave us another bigger house and none of those things happened. But within a few months, Christy now got a job back in her field, making more than she was making before. We started with the church plant we had started. People actually started giving to the church plant, saying, we think, we think we're supposed to start supporting you guys in this church plant. And we were like blown away. All because we stopped and started asking, God, what are you doing? And how can we see it? And how can we be thankful? So here's what I'd like us to do as we, as we close. Marcel and Cindy are going to come back up. We're going to finish with a worship song. But I'd, I'd like you to take just a moment. If, if you would, please, would you, would you just kind of block out everything around you? Just maybe close your eyes. Just kind of sit and listen. And I just want to ask you a few questions, a few places. Because nobody can, nobody can get to your motives but you and the Lord. So this is a you and the Lord conversation. And I'm going to ask you a few things to, to maybe engage with God about, Okay. Is there something like David that you have been carrying that you need to repent for? That you need to go and honestly own before the Lord and repent? And if that's where you are, you serve a merciful and grace-filled God. And if you've never said yes to him before, now's the perfect chance to say, yes, I need you, Jesus. Come meet me right here. And then maybe the next question is, what area of your life do you need God to redeem? Is it something around a relationship? Is it something around work? Is it something around health? 
Ask God to come, meet you in that place. And what actions do you need to begin taking with a right heart, with a pure heart, with a right motive? I have a feeling for some of you, as I've talked about actions with impure motives, it's struck something in you. You've realized you've been doing things, but not from a place of really loving God. And then as you, as you do this work with the Lord, we always have people that are glad to pray with you, but some of this may feel really personal and close, and I just want to give you permission to have that be with you. But I would like you, as you finish up whatever time, whatever God's stirring in your soul, I'd like you to take a few moments and then be thankful. Thank God for everything you can think of. And then let's worship. So, Lord, come even more in your spirit. Breathe on each and every person in this room, each and every person watching online. Everyone, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.